Today I wanted to deal with another issue, but before I get to that issue, I just wanted to give a brief about the videos that I re-upload that have been <laughs> blocked by uh, the activities of those who shall remain nameless. <laughs> but anyway, um, 18 of them now. The last ones that I did re-upload, these three here, um, are fairly old and a lot of the information that uh, these go back to November last year a lot of the information has been updated and corrected uh, these are more an upload to basically show what they didn't want put in the public arena but this one on bush bashing uh, that was recently uh, well, when I say recently, two days ago, it was deleted again. <laughs> so I just re-uploaded it. That one's fairly current, although everything that I can do as far as I can do this video now, and I can guarantee you that I'm going to learn something after I've done it, and I could update it again. So... Um, these three videos are more for reference that if you wanted to go back and see the sequence of my guesswork and investigations, I suppose you could say, is because this is a very complicated uh, development. It's had a lot of people involved for a lot of years and it also takes a lot to actually explore what all those parts are. And I'll be the first to admit, I've got some of that wrong. <laughs> Fairly wrong indeed. Uh, but others I've been quite right in. And uh, the thing being that it is constantly evolving to refine the difference between what is conjecture and what is factual and can be evidenced. And that is where the what is factual and can be evidenced is actually getting a lot stronger. But anyway, so I'm just pointing out that some of the videos that I do re-upload will actually be irrelevant in the sense that they, they may contain information that has already changed and been updated. So I did um and ah about re-uploading a lot of them because I know that there would have been changes. But I thought, no, I will just re-upload it put the date in there that it was originally uploaded so that you could actually listen to it in the context of what was actually known back then rather than where it's just been uploaded and it actually doesn't 100% accurately depict what I've actually come to uh, evidence as I said and to know and understand. And I'd also like to state too that each and every human being, no matter who you are, no matter what you hear, see or do, you ultimately have to judge for yourself what that information means. And also to understand that uh, as you get a child that knows less than an adult about certain things, <laughs> well, you will find that these videos here are childlike in my attempts Oh, well, in childlike in the sense of the accuracy of the information. It is more a childlike's curiosity to actually try and explore the facts to find out what the reality actually is. Because there's so many people involved, so many versions of events, it's hard to know what the basics of those events are. But it's also very clear to see that there are certain people that are involved and have been involved since these voxes were done in 2015, early 2015. Might have even been late December 2015. Uh, possibly not. I'd say it's definitely in the new year for sure. Anyway, these voxes actually reveal a lot about the current structure of Nightcap on Minjimbal and how it was to be set up in the future perspective. Now the only person that's actually not part of this picture anymore that was involved then and is involved now is actually Mark Darwin. 
and uh, he got paid out for him to get out and he hung on to those shares until it was convenient and he got paid and then he got out and that happened not so long ago in January chairs changed directorships changed I'll do that in another video anyway and take you more in depth because today's video is about uh, well let me show you now just as a side diversion here since I'm using Tyler Tolman's image out of his promotional video to illustrate a few things here today is that Tyler Tolman and heal thyself now he gives out the heal thyself as a email contact address but uh, I actually was notified by them that they no longer represent him and I thought that's a new what represent him what do you mean you no longer represent him I thought heal thyself was Tyler Tolman but apparently that is not the case heal thyself is clearly some kind of um, organization that caters to take in a lot of different individuals because in investigating who is currently involved with Nightcap on Minjimble at the investor level some of those can actually be associated with heal thyself so then the question I ask myself then is well what association do you have with them clearly heal thyself represents you not you are heal thyself but you are what well, I suppose taking on some type of a franchise name but anyway there seems to be a a prevalence of those that have an association with heal thyself that are in the current investors associated with nightcap on Minjimble but uh, you're probably wondering why I'm even mentioning any of this well there's a little thing that I discovered when I was looking into the companies and the people that when they are when they are directors or secretaries of companies they have to list their date of birth it's part of the information given out publicly shareholders it's not the same they only give out the address they do not give out the date of birth so it was interesting that in going through all these companies and exploring them I did notice certain peculiarities and I think I may have mentioned before about the possibility that the well the d date of birth that were actually given by people weren't completely accurate to the day they were actually born and this would actually stand to reason since they talk about their straw man and how your birth certificate is just a warehouse receipt and how it carries nothing but basically the slave owners you know mark on you so to actually think that they would treat the birth certificate and the date of birth with contempt and disrespect in the laws that actually require that you prove who you are say you know you are who you say you are because this is me I was born this particular date in this particular place it identifies you as a unique individual that's the way I look at the birth certificate not as a slave owner's certificate and basically you can't get anywhere without producing a copy a valid current copy of your birth certificate and it has to be valid and it has to be your birth certificate and providing a false birth certificate is actually a crime so you could imagine when I discovered that and the reason that I've used this image is because other than Tyler Tolman on here there is reason to believe that people have used false names and different dates of birth and that's what I'm going to exp explore here a little bit that Peter Van Leishout appears to have given two separate dates of birth and what are the chances of two Peter Anthony Van Leishouts being born in the same town a couple of years apart anyway Derek Zillman 
would explain that he made a typo error when he went to put in the K on his name and it typed in I and L instead of Derek, so he's actually the real Zillman. Identified by the date of birth, these people are the same people, or by the name, they are the same person, but they have given a different date of birth. Now I've got Cherie Stakes up here that it is suspected that at least uh, one person has used, well it's not suspected, it's known that one person has actually used her date of birth as his own. And that's this guy over here, Rich Moat. It's also believed that Cherie Stokes may have also made up that birth date because her and Martin Madron, her partner, seem to have very similar birth dates. They just changed the day slightly. And when you've got, I mean, it's not unheard of. You might have a couple that are born on the same day. I mean, it's, you know, one of those freaks of nature that does actually happen or that they're born within a certain period of time. I'm just saying that from a general perspective, it already raises flags when these people are not honest and upfront, or well, seemingly not honest and upfront about what's going on. And also that their lack of respect for the birth certificate, it's certainly something that you would anticipate with no respect. They have no problems in providing false information about it. Not only their name, but also their date of birth. Lake Cherie Stokes is known by three separate names, but that's only her, that's only one real name she's got there, Cherie Francis Stokes. The other names she uses are Cherie Nightcap and Cherie Noble. Richard Mode over here also uses Nightcap as a surname, like Cherie does. Very original thinkers, these two. So Richard Mote is also known as Richard Nightcap and most recently he was also given a tribal name that... <laughs> Mate, did that give you that name because you sell brown hash and uh, they, it's Jack because, you know, you come from the UK. <laughs> oh dear, mate. That's a good tribal name. Uh, you should have made it up like Gunham. Sorry, Mark McMurtry. But you see how he made that name up. It actually sounds a little bit more convincing that it's actually tribal than your name. <laughs> oh, dear me. Anyway, off subject here. Let me get back on subject. So the first false providing of date of birth information that I was suspicious on was when I noticed that Cherie Francis Stokes down here has a date of birth of 9th of November 1965 and Richard Mote who I had seen on other company searches was actually born in Ashford Kent the UK is now claiming to be born the 9th of November 1965 in Sydney New South Wales exactly the same as Cherie Stokes. Now I looked at this information and I thought well is this, this is is this correct? I checked it and rechecked it and it's like to me one of those isn't correct and I'd already looked at uh, Cherie Stokes and Martin Madron who are a couple and noticed that uh, she's on the 9th of November and, and he's in 1965 and he's just a few days away from her. It's like they all used one date of birth. Is it their correct date of birth? Is it someone else that they picked's date of birth and they just made changes on it? I don't know and I still don't know if this is Cherie Francis Stokes' correct date of birth. But I do know that Richard Moat was not born in Sydney, New South Wales on that date. He's actually given that he's been born in 
Ashford Kent in the United Kingdom. Now, this was further um, made a curious fact when I did another search, well, when was it, back in February, and a name that had come up before that I'd never, never heard of before, and yet again I noticed the same thing where Richard Mote had taken the other directors because you see Cherie Stokes was actually a director with him until she resigned sometime in June 2020. So he took on her date of birth and well I'll show you the, the other one. Now Richard Mote appears on other searches so the details that you get in one may not be exactly the same as what they've put in another one like in some he's put Ashford Kent UK and in others it's just been Ashford UK or in this instance he's just put UK but again here see Tatum is a director with him and I have no idea what this business is about I have no idea who Tatum is I'm assuming she's an ex-girlfriend. Uh, there's a few ex-girlfriends around with a lot of the guys to do with Nightcap and yes, I'm just assuming that anyway. But anyway, Tatum's date of birth down here is the same date of birth except he's changed it to the UK. So that's two instances where Richard Mote has not given his true date of birth or even country of birth, place of birth, and he's used the date of birth of the director that he's involved with in Mode Investments and Nightcap Realty. So the question being is that what is Richard Mote's real birthday? He seems to have a propensity to actually use other people's date of birth. And, well... As I said, I'm already questioning whether is it a coincidence that Cherie Stokes and her partner Martin Madron, who was supposedly born in New Zealand, are born only a few days apart. As I said, it's not unheard of. But you have particular peculiarities that stand out. And another thing too is that the thing that I've also said on trusts, when I see a trust, I see a red flag. Well, the thing being that most of the people that I'd actually been investigating in, in historical circumstances, in professional capacities, I was dealing with um, difficult people, difficult situations. So, of course, you see something like that and it's a red flag that they're trying to hide something. But I was actually educated that... Uh, most businesses will actually operate with a trust level capacity in there and it's not unusual in fact most businesses actually operate by it and it's not illegal it's all up front and from so from a general perspective these trusts are good things for people to operate with and when they're done properly and all the laws are followed it's fine I'm talking about um, a very narrow field of people when I say that when I see trust, I see warning, I see red flags. So I just wanted to clarify that, if I did clarify it at all. <laughs> Clear as mud, wasn't it? So back on to the fake um, or presumably not correct date of birth in that the discrepancies that Richard Mote now has got two dates of birth. One he claimed of Cherie Stokes and said that he was also born in New South Wales on the same day. And the other one, he's also born on the same day as Tatum McGeary. Now, as I said, I that was a, Tatum's name is a name that has never come up in relation to anything. So... The only thing I can assume is that maybe she is the ex that, well, you know how the bush rumour mills work and you hear things? <laughs> well, there was some involvement. Uh, 
I heard about, but yeah, I'm a, I don't know. As I said, that's not the point anyway. The point being that Richard Mote has yet again changed his birth date to that of the director. So when people use false uh, date of birth, whether they're using um, a relative's date of birth, uh, a fellow director's date of birth, or even one that they just made up, it's actually not a good idea, I suppose, for their, from their perspective to actually make up a date of birth that doesn't actually exist in the place that it is claimed. Like There is no birth record for Richard Mote on the 23rd of June 1977 in any state or territory in Australia. None. Go through the birth, deaths and marriages. You will not find his date of birth in Australia because he was not born in Australia. He was born in the United Kingdom. So for him to actually state that, yes, he was born on that day, well, Tatum was born on that day, and if we go back to the other one, Cherie claims she was born on that day, and isn't that funny that Richard Mote has just done a reincarnation. He's, he's been born once in the UK with a different birth date, and now in Australia with another birth date. So it's not, you know, a stretch of the imagination to actually say, well, I reckon they're all fake. And uh, I don't think that um, we any of us know what his real day, date of birth is. Now you look again here at Moat Holdings. Richard Moat has once again used that same date of birth from Tatum, the director of the other Mode Investments Company, and put in the UK. So he's made it half true by saying that he was born in the UK. He has stuck to that same line, as in, oops, sorry, this one where he's just copied it all and said, no, I'm not even born in the UK. So who is Richard John Mote? Where was he born and when was he born? And why is he coming up with so many dates of birth that don't appear to belong to him? So that's just Richard. Okay, so just before I introduce the list, I'll um, introduce the other ones that are on there. I don't actually, well, I do have an image of Martin Madron but I am not going to use it in this instance. As I said, the relationship between the date of birth similarity with Cherie Stokes and Martin Madron is not a questionable issue. Well, it is a questionable issue. It's a curiosity more than anything at this stage. The fact that it appears that Richard Mote has used Cherie's date of birth is more than obvious. It's uh, he's changed birth dates on several things that I've already showed you. But the other two, and Stephen McSween was a past lost investor, but apparently, so the rumour mill tells me that he's now back in. But he was actually a director of Wollumbin Horizons Proprietary Limited at some stage after Adrian Brennock down here. So He's been listed, and this is company associations that I'm looking at here. And yes, as I do believe that Steve McSween is getting back in. So I noted all the peculiarities that the common date of birth that Adrian Brennock has given appears to be his legitimate birth date. But there is also one listing for an Adrian Brennock that gives the 1st of January, 1600. <laughs> that is clearly a mistake. We know no one was born in 1600. It, I could almost imagine it as being one of those things that Adrian Brennock did to see if the system would accept that date of birth. Well, the answer to that question is, yes, it does. It's actually a searchable 
date of birth for Adrian Brannock. In every other instance, though, it appears that this date of birth is his correct date of birth. Now we look at Philip John Dixon that was born on the 1st of May 1955 in Mackay, Queensland. And back then it wasn't that big of a place either. Certainly wouldn't have been that many Dixons and there certainly would have been even less Philip John Dixons being born within two years of each other. So I do believe from all the information that's been provided through a lot of search uh, extracts with companies that the 1st of May 1955 is his correct date of birth and he has for some reason used a false date of birth. Maybe it's another Philip John Dixon that was born to a completely different and unrelated family somewhere in Mackay that yeah well as I said in 1955 it wasn't a very big town <laughs> yeah I don't think that you would have had someone name their child exactly the same way might have called him Philip but he would have a different middle name I don't see many naming their children especially related to each other the exact same way coincidence maybe maybe not because it appears that Philip Dixon likes to also name companies after numbers or property addresses and things like that. And there's a company that uh, he put into liquid, well, it went into liquidation. It's the only company that he's actually still currently listed as a director for that um, isn't one to do with Nightcap on Mingimble that uh, doesn't have a very good history it's in liquidation doesn't look like it's been finalized yet but as I'm also beginning to learn is that there's a reason that charges do not appear any more on the ATSIC regist register in their lodgement of doc documents it's because there's a different register to search now <laughs> to find out the information about the charges so um, that is something that I am going to investigate a little bit further so I can then see if there are any charges that have been laid against the company that I would have ordinarily, years ago before they changed it, found it in the lodgement of documents through ATSIC, but now doing it somewhere else. So yes, as I said earlier, that it is up to people to take the information that I am uh, investigating and bringing out and judging for yourself what is actually yeah well that doesn't sound right or yeah that sounds logical I mean it's up to you to make the final decision on what I say about the information especially something that like as I said with my videos that were done in November I had a lot less information available to me to and a lot more ponderings and conclusions that I had to guess at to wonder what was going on much more than things have been refined by documentation and by the help of so many wonderful people and it is what I have been experiencing about what a true community is is where I can understand that what they're trying to create at NICAP isn't real community. It doesn't even start with a quality and, well, respect for your other, other community members. Yeah, we have our differences. <laughs> we all do. But you know what? We don't argue about them. And when we have a difference of opinion, we just say, yeah, well, I think of it this way. And it's like... Yeah, actually, I could see that point, yeah. So we learn from each other in the expressions of our curiosities and refine the information. Because when you're dealing with people that do not want to honestly disclose things, you have to do a lot of guesswork. And a lot of my guesswork has been wrong. <laughs> it's been kind of close, some of it. Some of it's been spot on. So it's all becoming a mixed bag of now I'm trying to actually 
well not becoming a mixed bag I'm taking a mixed bag and trying to refine it into factual information and here I am back again into the ponderings of wondering what all these false date of births mean because well I've explained Richard Mites Philip John Dixon his might be simply because he wanted to use a different date of birth because he had a company that was in liquidation and it would tie it back to him. It would come up as a cross directorship because of the date of birth, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there are many reasons. And I found out that if you also lodge an alteration, you can make something disappear from ASIC, <laughs> even though that document that removed it is still publicly accessible. And this is also another thing that I've learned is that going into the next layer and actually looking at those documents that were lodged is also an important thing to know what has actually gone on. And that's how sometimes only those documents will tell you why someone like Michaela Lowe completely disappeared from one of the nightcap companies. And it was done through an alteration document that said, well, we appointed Michaela Lowe by accident. You know, <laughs> how do you appoint a director by accident? Well, I think the thing was that it was all going smooth and yes, she was going to be director and they're all going to be involved. And then, oops, they found out that Iman was under investigation. And then last year, we also found out that he wound up in court with more allegations and ongoing investigations. So it seemed a logical choice that when they found that out, to just completely backtrack with a document that says remove her and Michaela Lowe also backed that up with her own statement that said that she was put on there in error. Now I dare say that was all part of their agreement too because Michaela Lowe wanted to sh sell the share that she's now got in a Mount Burrell commercial. She tried advertising it on what was it um, Gumtree that's right and because they didn't want her advertising it on Gumtree, they said, look, we'll buy it back off you. Here's, you know, some of the money for that share and we'll put the other into Mount Burrell. Now, I'm assuming this is what happened anyway. Put the other into Mount Burrell and you can hold that until we come up with the rest of the money to buy you out. Because, oh, lo and behold, poor Michaela needed money to actually deal with her husband's criminal defence. And we, well... We know he had to come up with a criminal defence. All his court listings, it's a matter of public record. It's also a matter of public articles that were done on the fact that, well, much like ATSIC don't want to give up on Jason Beddles, which is Adrian Brennock's bankruptcy trustee, they don't want to give up, uh, the police don't want to give up on Imon Lowe and holding him to account for what they believe he has done. Then we get down to Peter Anthony Van Lyshout. Now, he was actually born again in another country. So, to say that there were two Peter Anthony Van Lyshouts born in exactly the same town, in exactly the same place, except two different dates of birth. Again, it quest brings to mind the question, was well from what that would appear to be that there are two Peter Anthony Van Lyshouts living in Australia and I don't think there's two I think there's only one again it's a questionable thing when there are two dates of birth conflicting dates of birth that give very clear and identifying information like with Peter Van Lyshout where he is born in a very identifiable place so anyway then we get down to Steve McSween who was actually a director of as I said Wollumbin Horizons he's given two dates of birth in Tarang Victoria uh, you know roughly about two years apart or well, not quite two years apart again this could be there are you know two Steve and Peter McSween's uh, in the 80s, Victoria is a big place. It is possible 
that there were two Peter McSweens that were born in Terang, Victoria. Uh, uh, unlikely, but still possible. Now, then we get down to Dean Rodimer. Now, the, the thing that I actually drew my attention and I actually made inquiries was that Dean Rodimer and Mark Cora had virtually the same date of birth, 11th of June, except Dean was 1964 and Mark was 1946. So it looked like they switched it round. And I don't think Mark Cora was born in 1946. I think it was more like 1964 around that time. But you just put the numbers back to front. Again, you could think that, well, I just made a mistake. I'm dyslexic. I got it back to front. Which is what the real John Dillman would actually think that he actually made a typo. But anyway, I'll get to that one in a sec. So I actually questioned it and tried to find out, and I actually found out that Dean Rodimer's correct date of birth is the 13th of March, 1967. So I know for a fact that Dean Rodimer, who is um, the holder of the MT discretionary, or the Mingimble Trust discretionary, along with Mark Cora, I know that Dean Rodimer provided a false date of birth. I know that for a fact. <laughs> well, as much as a fact as anyone knows that when he was born and celebrates his birthday with him in the past is done and knows <laughs> yeah he was not born on the 11th of june and if you actually notice it you go to his facebook profile and he actually talks about celebrating his birthday in march very recently and that also confirmed that the date of birth that I had been given him was also correct when he's actually saying, I'm celebrating my birthday. <laughs> so that, that's kind of a no-brainer. So I then question whether Mark Cora has actually likewise given a false date of birth. Well, I know that he wasn't, I don't think he was born in 1946. My mum was born in, uh, in that decade. And he's nowhere near well, how old my mum would be. Anyway, so let's go down to other false name representations. The real John Zillman, born on exactly the same date in Gosford, New South Wales, as Derek John Zillman. So he has used a false name there. But he would also claim, oh, look, that was a typo, because if you look at the keyboard... When you hit K, I is like, say, for example, that you had fat fingers and it hit both the one atop to it and next to it. How you'd actually expect to do that, I don't know. You'd hit the I and the O or the O and the L, not the I and the L. But I dare say that if that discrepancy was picked up because it doesn't actually attach to Derek John Zillman because it's a different name. And if he was questioned, you'd go, no, my name's Derek, that's just a typo. And then you'd look at the keyboard and you'd say, oh, yes, there's the I and there's the L. I can see how that happened. Yes, mate, sorry, uh, we didn't mean to accuse you of anything. Honest mistake. No, as a touch typist, I can tell you that if you make an error touch typing, you're not going to hit the one above and the one to the right. You might hit the one above and to the right of the one above, but not directly to the right. You cannot make a typo with I-L instead of K. You could do I-O instead of K. You might even do O-L instead of K. But you cannot do I-L, not even with fat fingers, because you would have had to have got I-O and L in there. So anyway... That's just another thing. It clearly is Derek John Zillman with a typo. Now, if you look at Christiane Brennock, Adrian Brennock's wife, that he transferred the shares of Nyepi into her name and the directorship and secretary to avoid the seizure in bankruptcy. And when that occurred, Christiane Brennock was noted as the shareholder. But when they put down her name as director and secretary, 
They put down her first name as Brannock and her surname as Christy Ann. So she now comes up uh, with only if you searched for a name on Christy Ann Brannock, you would only find that she holds shares in Yepi. You would find that Brannock Christy Ann is the director and secretary. But accordingly, they are two different people because they have different they have different names, even though they have different dates of birth. I mean the same dates of birth. Again, you could say, look, I'm sorry this was a mistake. Where you asked for my Christian name, I put in my surname, and where you asked for my surname, I put in my Christian name. So I made a mistake, sorry. Again, you can see that this is a mistake that they could easily explain away as a mistake, even if it was deliberate to do it that way. Because why would you then, this, to appoint her, uh, he's had to go through and fill out common forms. He's done it correct in one circumstance. And in the next circumstance, he, he got his wife's Christian name as Brennock and mixed it up. I'm just kind of having a bit of a problem in believing that was actually an accident. Again, it might have been an accident. And I dare say that a lot of these little things, I'll say, oh, well, you know, I got it wrong there. I got confused. I put my surname instead of my Christian name, blah, blah, blah. And yes, typo error when I was typing it in online, I hit the wrong key. No, as I just explained, Derek, I, I actually believe that has got to be more along the lines of something that has been done deliberately and is not a typo error. Of course, you're quite welcome to show me how you could actually do that on a keyboard and make that typo error with I and L without the O. Uh, or you could, yeah, quite welcome to prove me wrong. As I said, everything is about evolving the information to get it to a stage where it is the most accurate that can be gathered because of the hmm, lack of cooperation. Well, you can understand that too. <laughs> I mean, it's not like most people. Like you don't you go out and say to a crook, look, confess all your crimes. I go, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do it for you. <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, it doesn't work that way. I know in the fairyland world that these people create it probably might work that way, but in the real world that most people live in, no, they don't. So... Looking at all the false names, dates of births and everything that have been used with the people that have been associated, you're looking at the upper level tier of management, those that are controlling it. Cherie Stokes was involved long before Bulla Bulla with Mark Darwin and Adrian Brennock with Creative Foundation. Cherie was the go-to girl. There was the three of them. You will hear them talk about, if me or AB can't help you, Cherie can. This is Cherie, Cherie Stokes, Cherie Nyka, Cherie Noble. Whatever name she goes by. And uh, yes, well, clearly there's a reason why she doesn't like much of the rest of her photograph. Hey, we've all got body issues, you know, but we are what we are and you should accept who you are and not pretend to be something that you're not. But anyway, I'm going to finish it up there with um, a little bit of a lead in to the next video that I want to do. It won't be today, but uh, I'm still trying to refine the information so that I can give people a more accurate account of the money trail. It has taken uh, some effort and, as I said, to the help of a lot of wonderful people that have provided information well, far beyond what um, Rhyme Earth Healer posted on Facebook, put it that way. <laughs> so I was able to follow the money trail. There are a few gaps that, uh, I'm, I'm, well, I will explain them as I do the next video on that. Because the way that Nightcap uh, Village is at the moment... NCV Enterprises, Mount Burrell Commercial and the other member companies 
are basically pro they're supported by investors or loans the and the Mount Burrell commercial area is certainly a money drain not a profit maker and you'll understand why I say that when I show you three years worth of Mount Burrell commercials accounts and how much came in and how much went out and that isn't even taking into consideration what they weren't taking out of Mount Burrell commercial to pay for a lot of other things it was coming out of well allocated to NCV enterprises like all the legal expenses and everything so I want to explore the money trail in a little bit more depth as far as I, I have been able to piece together right back from the original investors at Bulla Bulla to today and what is going on today and also with the current position of the past lost investors on the verge of getting their money back through the liquidation of the Phoenix sale of 3222 Kyogre Road. And it is without a doubt a Phoenix manoeuvre that Adrian Brennock described and completed in 2020. And just in case people don't know, I don't call it an illegal Phoenix manoeuvre because a Phoenix manoeuvre is illegal. So it is very highly illegal and Adrian Brennock did a video in 2015 coincidentally June 2015 five years later in June 2020 he does another video and brags about his Phoenix maneuver so he talks about it in the voxes and he videos himself bragging about it in 2020 puts it up online to actually confirm yes I did Phoenix it I did get it back and the past lost investors are still waiting for their money and it's only the money that they put in as a share value all the other money that they were made to spend that they would never get back because they would be looked at as uh, well like any creditor invoice would be looked at in a liquidation and the liquidator said that no creditor invoices would be paid only trust creditors will be paid and that's because again part of the financial side of it when you look at those with a valid claim that would get their money back including what's owed to the council making an estimation for particular um, other things that they have included as costs and you end up with well I'm gonna leave that on a cliffhanger <laughs> here I am trying to explain it all it's like I'm going to do a separate video on that I will not try and cram it into the end of this video this video is focused on questioning the date of births that have been provided to ASIC by these particular individuals and also the names that they have used has it been a mistake that Brennock Christiane isn't Brennock Christiane but actually Christiane Brennock or that Derek Zillman isn't Daryl Zillman is actually Derek Zillman is it an accident that Richard Moat took Cherie Stokes's birthday and then took Tatum's birthday and then Peter Van Lyshout over here well there were two Peter Anthony Van Lyshouts born in his town within a very short amount of time of each other again like with Steve McSween he did it within a year time period the thing is though that if you're going to use a reasonable date of birth to say well I made a mistake like Derek Zillman could say he made a mistake it's believable may not be true I don't know that but it's believable 
and Brenor Christiane. Again, believable mistake. Even with Mark Cora changing it from 64 to 46. Again, dyslexic a bit. Believable mistake. But to completely change the day, month and year and make it about 18 months apart... That almost seems to me like someone said, well, if you're going to give a false date of birth, make it close enough, but, yeah, make it within the 18 months. I don't know. I've never done these things, and I never would, so I wouldn't know. I mean, it's hard enough to use the one birth certificate that you've got. I mean, oh, they want it everywhere. Show your birth, birth certificate. You know, where's your ID? And so without a valid birth certificate, date of birth. See, this, these people think that having a birth certificate makes you owned by someone. It doesn't make you owned. It just identifies you as a unique individual. Now, one of the people on this page, and I won't name them, has a child that doesn't even have a birth certificate, is not a valid, recognised human being and citizen in Australia, has no legal rights in Australia whatsoever as an Australian citizen, simply because they do not exist, because without a birth certificate, that person doesn't exist. They can't get Medicare, they can't get a tax file number. There's so many things that a person that doesn't exist can't get because they don't exist. People think that they're doing their child a favour by not registering their birth. Well, you better be able to hope that you can homeschool that child for their whole life and then when they become an adult and they want to go out there and work and not follow by the same example you led but do their own thing, they will be, they can't even prove that they, where's your birth certificate? Even a job provider, even a, a an employer will ask your date of birth and for proof of it a driver's license oh but you don't need a driver's license because you're driving on tribal land and you've got permission what a load of hogwash those that haven't registered their children as being born have failed to give them any rights at all as a human being as a person, they don't even exist. They are flesh and blood, but you have taken away their existence by not saying they, have, they have officially exist. Anyway, <laughs> enough of the subject changes. And for the financials, I will do another video on that. It's very in-depth, and I do, I'm sorry if I pulled myself up on the long-winded explanation, but... Uh, yeah, that's a complex subject that I can only show you by taking you into the accounts and uh, the people, what they spent, the, the investors spent, and what the developers at Nightcap spent. Uh, also a considerable amount of money in lawyers' fees that they actually sued other people to stop them. And for all intensive purposes, they may think that that money was well spent because of the judgment that they received out of it. But, you know, that was... You can't help bad judgments in civil cases. And that's where my focus is not on civil cases. It's on criminal. To my belief, there have been a lot of crimes committed by the activities of many people associated with NICAP on Minjimbal. Crimes that they need to answer for. Not that I need to ask them any more details about, well, are you going to be honest? Are you going to tell us? I'm not playing the secret squirrel game anymore. That is for official investigators to actually delve that little bit deeper. Because even with the investigations I do, there's a level of confidentiality that the police are only going to be able to find out. And also 
court orders. But then again, subpoenas to get uh, records and information is not also necessary in a lot of circumstances. In some circumstances, it's actually up to that person to prove how they got that money and where it went, rather than me show how they actually got that money. It's for them to show that how that money came into their possession and the way it was used was in a completely le legitimate and valid way and with the consent of any of those that that money is part of the trust of. Anyway, enough for this video. Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> I shall talk to you next time. Take it easy. Bye.